Today, I, along with some very special guests, are going to tell you guys about my very favorite builds that I've created for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition 2014 rules, in what apparently we're going to call the first annual Colby Awards. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, uh, D4, each week we take a deep dive into specific character builds for my favorite role-playing games. I like to crunch numbers about them, I like to theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way even to play a character, but to explore one potential way to build something with the hopes of creating a character that's both really powerful but also really fun to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you are just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then uh, welcome home. Yeah. This is where where you belong and I am so glad you're here so thank you for watching my name is Colby so in a very short time two things are going to happen one the channel is going to celebrate its four-year anniversary that's kind of hard for me to believe honestly what an amazing privilege and blessing it has been to be doing this every week thank you all so much for making that possible Two, those of us who have had early access to the new 2024 version of the Player's Handbook are going to get the green light from Wizards of the Coast to start talking about everything in detail. That's right, August 1st. As a result of both of those things happening at almost the exact same time, I have been feeling both a desire to kind of close the book on the 2014 5e chapter of my channel and kind of take a look back on all of the 170 or so builds that I've done over the years for Dungeons and Dragons. Now, longtime viewers of the channel know that about once a year or so, I put out a ranking my builds video or three, where I quickly go over every build for sustained damage, then burst damage, then tank builds, and kind of talk about where they rank. But also, those rankings aren't particularly reflective of actual power level or even fun level for a build, right? They're just based on a number that's overly simplistic. Now, as much as I would love to do like some kind of an attempt at an objective true ranking of every single one of my builds, putting them all into like S, A, B tiers, etc., that's pretty much impossible. For one, I'm not sure how I'd do that objectively without actually having played each of them from level one to 17. For two, I just don't have that kind of time. <laughs> what I thought I would do instead then, and with a little help and guidance from everyone in the D4 Discord server, oh, uh, by the way, maybe let me pause quickly and give a shout out and thank you to all of my channel members. You guys are amazing. You enable all of this to happen week in and week out. For everybody else, I would love it if you'd consider consider joining the channel as a member. There's a little button down there. It says join. Click on it. It'll tell you about all the little perks you can get by being a member, including access to the library of write-ups that I do for each of my builds to help you recreate them yourself a little more easily. Access to, yeah, the D4 Discord uh, server filled with wonderful, lovely people. And even access to the monthly live Q&A hangout sessions that we do. But you know what? If you don't want to become a member of the channel for any reason, that's fine. I appreciate you just being here, watching, liking, subscribing, commenting, sharing with your friends. These are all also fantastic ways to support the channel, so thanks. Uh, anyways, yes, with uh, the channel members' input, I've decided instead to hold what I'm going to call, yeah, the first annual Colby Awards. <laughs> that name was not my idea, by the way, I promise. Anyways, I'm going to give out awards to my builds for three different categories. First, the best concept build, or said less succinctly, the best build where I put artificial restrictions on myself as I built it in the name of character concept. Next, we will go with the most powerful build, and finally, we will end with the most fun build. I appreciate that none of these are going to be particularly objective. I don't know how to be totally objective. I feel like I'm judging between my own children here, but I have done my best to 
take a look at every character I've created and really evaluate them based on not only how much damage they can do or how much damage they can sustain for that matter or how much healing they can do, etc., but also how easy it is for them to do what they were meant to do. Do they require a lot of setup or not? Do they do just one thing really well or are they fairly well rounded? How long does it take the build to come online, etc, etc. Of course, I can't just talk about one build for each category. Instead, I'm going to present a bunch of nominees for each, talk about each of them a little bit, and then give out the award to my very favorite, which was agonizing, honestly. <laughs> oh, and hey, I've got a special surprise for you, like I mentioned. I've got some special guests presenting the nominees and the award. I mean, I've got to make it feel like a real award show, you know? Speaking of, now we're talking, class this place up a little. I think we're ready. I proudly present D&D episode number 175, the first annual Colby Awards. <laughs> but first, a word from our sponsor. Okay, so true story. For years now, I have suffered from some lower back pain. It's only on my lower left side. I think it's from like an old injury. Anyways, the pain has rarely been debilitating. It only comes up if I like re-injure it working out or something. But just about every morning for the last several years, I'll wake up stiff and sore in my lower left back. I get massages regularly to treat it. I've tried different mattresses to sleep on, but it never really seems to go away. Enter the sponsor for today's video, Helix Sleep. Oh. They sent me a mattress to try out a couple of months ago, and I'm dead serious here. Ever since I've been sleeping on it, I no longer wake up stiff and sore in my lower left back. I'm converted. So here's the thing about Helix mattresses. Before you even order one, they have you take a sleep quiz to help figure out your body type and your sleep preferences so that you can get the perfect mattress for you. I sleep on my side and tend to prefer like a little bit of a softer mattress because I feel like it's got enough give for my shoulders and like my hips to sink in so I kind of get some lumbar support in the middle. Anyways, I took the test before I ordered my mattress and I got matched up with the Sunset Lux. But there are 20 unique mattresses that they offer including the Lux and the Ultra Premium Elite collections, the Helix Plus for like big and tall builds, and even Helix Kids for bodies that are still growing. With mine, they also included this Glaciotex cooling cover because I sleep hot and I have absolutely noticed a difference in how hot I get at night now. I no longer have to turn on our ceiling fan here in order to uh, keep me cool enough to sleep at night. So yeah, I've been sleeping on this for a couple of months now and it's unquestionably the best sleep that I've had in years, if not decades. So check it out. Right now, Helix is having a 4th of July sale. They're giving you either 30% off any Lux or Elite mattress plus two free pillows or 25% off anything on their site. But here's the best part. They have a 100 night sleep trial. So you get more than three months to test this out and see if you really like it. If not, send it back, get a full refund. Their mattresses have a 10-year warranty and they even have financing options and flexible payment plans if you decide that you do want to keep it and I'm convinced that you will. Shipping is free in the US, it comes rolled up in a box delivered right to your door. You just unpack it and let it unroll, setup is super easy. So you've really got nothing to lose. I'm putting a link in the video description and in the pinned comment. Click on it, if you would, to check out the limited time sale. Uh, that way they know I sent you. And yeah, try it out for yourself. A huge thanks to Helix Sleep. Seriously, I love this mattress. I am not kidding. All right, let's get back to the awards. Quick note. I don't have enough cards to link to all of these builds in the video, but I will put up the thumbnail for each of them, and as always, you can find my table of contents in the video description where I give a little overview of every single one of my builds, a breakdown of it by class and subclass, and each video title is hyperlinked, so it'll take you straight there. All right, first up, we've got the best concept build. I love building around a certain maybe like underpowered weapon or subclass or spell or sometimes around a specific theme or character idea. I really love taking those things and kind of pouring over all of the available character options to find a way to not only stick to the theme or self-imposed limitation, but make the character as effective and powerful as possible while doing so. And now. 
I am pleased to introduce the special guest presenting the nominees for the Best Concept Build, a man who I envy for his humor, kind-heartedness, freaking amazing channel growth, and incredible beard. The Brit who can rock a beanie and a Mexican poncho like nobody before or since, the legend, my friend Will from D&D Shorts. It is an honor to be here at the 2024 Colby's. I would like to formally apologize for my conduct last year after I slapped Pointy Hat for not keeping my wife's name out of his gosh darned mouth. The nominees for the 2024 Best Concept Build are the Pokemon Trainer. This is one of the first concept builds I ever did on my channel, and I think to date it's still the one that took me the longest to build. I spent literally days writing and then rewriting this one as I tried to work it out. The concept was this. What is the most powerful character I could build who only relied on their various pets and summons to fight for them? If the character couldn't ever make any attacks themselves, nor cast spells that directly did damage, etc. Uh, maybe because they were something of a pacifist, or maybe because they were just really good at managing and controlling other creatures to do their bidding for them. The result result was this menagerie manager who ended up with, I think, five creatures doing battle for them by the end. And they ended up doing a surprising amount of damage, all things considered, as well as having tons of friends to help them out and even soak up some damage on the battlefield. The Dive Bomber. Okay, this one was pretty far out there. I had had so many requests to build around this idea before I finally decided to try it out. A character who grapples their enemy, flies up into the air as high as possible, 200 feet or more, and then drops them for big falling damage. It's pretty sticky. It would only realize its full potential in like outdoor or big ceilinged environments, right? And you might run into some DMs that would further restrain the build because they don't think you could actually lift an enemy into the air to fly with you, depending on their size and their weight. But if everything came together for this one, it would be pretty hilarious to just grapple, fly, and drop your poor enemies over and over and over again for big damage where, unless they could fly themselves, they wouldn't really be able to do anything to avoid taking most of the damage we would be repeatedly subjecting them to. The Nuclear Wizard. This one was a build that I made for Will Wheaton, or for anyone else who feels like the dice gods just hate them and so don't want to have to ever roll to try and do damage to something, right? Admittedly, I didn't come up with the concept of the nuclear wizard. I think that was Ludic Savant, uh, the guy whose DPR calculator I used to crunch all of my numbers, which I link to the video description in every video, by the way. Yeah, Ludic is awesome. But the idea is an evocation wizard who takes hexblade levels to do guaranteed magic missile damage, enhance by Hexblade's curse and empowered evocation. I was pleased with additions that we made of adding Cloud of Daggers, Telekinetic, and some fighter levels for massive burst damage capability though, most of which was just guaranteed. The Needler. The Needler was the first build I ever did around a specific weapon that everyone saw as a little meh mechanics wise, right? The dart. Could we make this little unassuming d4 damage weapon not just viable, but powerful? I was very pleased to discover that yes, we could, with a little out of the box thinking and by trying to take advantage of what made the weapon unique, namely that it was the only thrown weapon that was also considered a ranged one. We combined Battlemaster Fighter, uh, Rogue Assassin, and Gloomstalker Ranger to devastating effect with our little dart thrower, and I was so very proud of how it turned out, if I'm being honest. The Thornlock. This baby is for sure one of my favorites. I think when I created it, it was maybe the silliest thing that I'd ever done up until that point. The challenge I gave myself for this build was basically, how much damage could I possibly do to an enemy if I only returned damage to them when they hit me? I never made any other attacks or anything otherwise. This was so much fun to build and to share with everyone, and yeah, I was kind of blown away by how much damage we could actually get out of the character if we simply grappled someone and then let them hit us. Thanks to stuff like Armor of Agathis, Fire Shield, a Cloak of Flies, and other things, it turns out that if you combine all of those return damage upon being hit or cause damage if you just keep someone close to you effects, you can do a whole lot of damage. And the best part was the damage happened regardless of the enemy's defenses. If they hit you, they just took the damage. So the build ended up performing surprisingly well on the spreadsheets, especially as their armor class and or saves increased because those things didn't matter. The Martyr. 
Ah, the Martyr, the only healer build that gets nominated in this category. This one is very near and dear to my heart, probably because it's also known as the mom. The question I tried to answer with this one was, how effective a healer could I be if I only healed with the life transference spell? The answer? Surprisingly effective. As long as you could survive the damage that you would take every time you healed with it. Anyways, it was fun, it was kind of funny, and honestly, I think it would make a really solid character. That life transference spell heals for a ton. And we found some fun ways both to enhance it and improve our own survivability while we were at it. The Frost Mage. Uh, here's another one that I had gotten a ton of requests for before I finally tried to build it. The rule for the Frost Mage was I could only do damage with spells and things that did cold damage, thus letting us live out our Snow Queen or Mr. Freeze fantasies. The other goal I had given myself here, though, was that I wanted to not only do good cold based damage, but I wanted to be able to do things with the character that you would expect cold based spell casters to be able to do, and namely slow and freeze their enemies, right? By combining the Fathomless Warlock with the Blue Dragon Sorcerer and tons of great spells and subclass abilities, I think we did a bang up job of accomplishing that goal. The One Hit Wonder. Uh, this one was my quest to answer the question, how much damage could we do if we only made one single attack in a round of combat? I don't know why this character could only make one attack. Maybe they were one punch man. Maybe they got really exhausted after their one hit. Regardless, it was a total Frankenstein of a build. Divine Soul Sorcerer, Whisper's Bard, Paladin, Grave Cleric, and Genie Warlock. They like set everything up and then let loose with an incredibly devastating single attack that was a lot of fun to build around and fantasize about. The Cantrip Blaster? This was a fun one that asked how much damage could we do with a character if we could only do damage with cantrips. The idea, of course, being that the thing that makes spellcasters so powerful in D&D isn't fireball or disintegrate, though those damage spells are great, but instead it's wall of force, a web, hypnotic pattern, fear, fly, haste, invisibility, etc. In other words, the best spellcasters save most of their spell slots for battlefield control, buffing, debuffing, and utility, rarely for damage, right? With that understanding, I wanted to build a character who did really solid damage with their cantrips so they could plan on saving all of those spell slots for the more important and powerful spells, thus feeling like they were still pumping out pretty decent damage while simultaneously concentrating on other non-damage spells. We ended up being a little all over the place again here, Evocation Wizard, Alchemist Artificer, even some dips into Fighter and Death Cleric. But I think the result was pretty potent. The Invisible Hypnotist. And finally, yes, that character who wanted to be effective but remain invisible during the entire encounter via not greater invisibility, no, that would be cheating. Instead, just by using the second level invisibility spell that breaks when you attack or cast a different spell. Why did this character want to remain invisible all the time? I don't know. Maybe they were a coward. Maybe they promised a loved one to stay alive at all costs or avoid combat as a pacifist again or something. The bigger question might be, what can a character do during combat if they can never attack or cast a spell? Turns out, quite a bit. Mostly in the form of control and support thanks to their enchantment wizard levels and yeah, even artillerist artificer levels. And the Colby goes to. The Needler. Right, so am I supposed to give like an acceptance speech now as the needler? <laughs> oh, I'm not enough of a cosplayer to do that. I need a needler outfit. Okay, right, so in case you didn't know, I actually put out a poll to my channel members on my community page naming several nominees for each of these categories and asking people to vote for their favorite or write one in that wasn't listed. I really hate that YouTube only allows for five options when I post a poll. I wanted to put all 10 of these. Anyways, while I did allow myself to be persuaded by channel members' opinions, I maintained the right to overrule the majority if I had strong feelings about it. Fortunately, in every single one of them, what I thought would be the winner and what most people voted for ended up being the same. And so, yeah, the need alert is just my favorite on this list. My friend Scott uh, played this build in a one-shot and was easily the MVP of that session, doing almost all of the heavy lifting damage-wise. Um, check out that one-shot here if you haven't seen it. He just destroyed everything, all with darts. And like up until this point in my career, I don't think I'd ever seen anyone make a really effective build using the dart. And I also don't know that I'd seen a lot of 
people talking about combining Assassin Rogue with Gloomstalker and Battlemaster for that reason. I mean, the Gloomstalker was still fairly new at the time. I definitely never saw anybody put it together like this so that they could quick toss a net and then fill their enemy with darts, at least. It just felt like the perfect combination of like flavor meets power. So I was so pleased to see that most voters agreed with me on this one. Congratulations, Needler. You win my everlasting adoration. Oh, how about uh, this candle from Tabletop Candle Company? Mmm, smells like pine. It's delicious. Okay, moving on to the second category, the most powerful build, or maybe I should call this one the most rage-inducing for a DM. I appreciate that determining a build's power level is going to have to consider a lot more than just how much damage can they do in the vacuum of a lab and a spreadsheet, right? A character might theoretically do a ton of damage, but what if they can't hold on to their saving throw that allows them to do that damage? Or get surprise if the build is dependent upon surprise, or survive more than three rounds because they're so dang squishy, etc, etc. And so this category had to be about more than just look at the damage leaders on the spreadsheets and pick the top one. That said, sure, I definitely did take the spreadsheets into account and also tried to factor in other things like survivability or versatility, uh, setup required, if any, and a whole other slew of things, including input from my channel members. And so here to announce the nominees is my good friend and mentor, the smartest and most gracious D&D content creator the world has ever seen, the guy who has more D&D experience and knowledge in his little finger than I have in my entire body, who I myself often look to for advice and analysis, the one and only Chris, aka Triamonk. Hey Colby, thanks for having me come and present the nominees for the most powerful build. Uh, so our nominees are the cheese grater. Ah, uh, yes, the original and best of all of my cheese graters. This one has been near the top of the sustained damage charts ever since I built them. And thanks to the way that spike growth damage just happens when you're moved across it, regardless of your AC or saving throw, and thanks to the fact that this sore lock just automatically pushed and pulled you without allowing you to make a saving throw so long as they simply hit you. Yeah, this one's a classic and just does a boatload of damage with relative ease, so long as you're okay potentially making life for your melee allies miserable, at least those who aren't themselves trying to grapple enemies and drag them along the edge of spike growth, right? Great that cheese. The Holy Warrior. The thing I love most about the Holy Warrior is that they are a freaking wrecking ball that just works. They kind of combine all of my favorite, like, big, beefy weapon user features into one build. Great Weapon Master, Polar Master, Reckless Attack, and even Divine Smite when you need it, though this one was built for sustained damage, not burst. And I mean, thanks to being mostly a paladin, they of course had fantastic defensive and support options they could bring while they were just pulverizing everything in sight. I also, as an aside, really love the idea of combining the Zealot Barbarian with the Devotion Paladin. It makes for like the quintessential raging inquisitor who cannot and will not be stopped in their perhaps flawed pursuit of righteousness. And I am here for it. Oh, and PS, thanks to the Devotion Pally buff coming in 2024, yeah, this one is even better in the new player's handbook. As are, to be fair, a ton of these builds. The Starry Night? This relatively recent build has a very special place in my heart because I played it for the better part of a year in a campaign. You know, sometimes your party just really benefits from doing damage to multiple enemies every round. And when you can bring a character that does that better than just about any other build could, while also being capable of holding the role of party healer, you've got yourself a fantastic character that any party would just love to have. This one combined Star's Druid with Light Cleric and a teeny little genie warlock dip for a devastating effect to multiple enemies every round, and it both just wrecks and sustains to a degree that will make your allies love you and your DM kinda hate you, possibly, hopefully not. The Mount and Blade. This build is the strongest tank build that I've ever done, period. I know it's not at the top of the like tank survivability spreadsheet. I know it was actually two character builds put into one, but yeah, it doesn't get any better than the Mountain Blade. Why? Well, as I often mention when I do tank builds, right, there are very few ways in D&D 5e to actually force your enemy to attack you instead of your friends, which, aside from surviving, is really a tank's primary job, right? With the Mountain Blade build, not only do you 
you get to ride on the back of your centaur player friend, but thanks to the mounted combatant feat, you get to force, yes, force, any attack directed at your centaur ally to target you instead. And thus, outside of knocking you out of the saddle or maybe just doing loads of AoE damage, or, well, killing you or incapacitating you anyways, which would prove incredibly difficult for this beefcake of a character, it's pretty much impossible for your centaur ally to take damage. And thus, the tank can do their job of keeping at least one of their companions alive almost flawlessly. They ended up getting some great abilities to help protect their other companions as well, and the icing on the cake was the way the centaur player, who was mostly a rogue, got to double up on sneak attack damage pretty much every single round thanks to the sentinel feat. It might be cheating to include this build in the nominees, since it was actually two builds, I know. But I think there is better synergy between these characters than for any other duo build that I've ever done, and there's a handful of them. And I just would have felt remiss if I didn't include them here because the combo is just so dang powerful. I really hope you get a chance to play this combo with your friend. It would be freaking awesome. And if you have had a chance to play this at a table with an ally, I would love to hear about it in the comments. Let me know if it's really as good as I think it is. The Lockadin Bard. Here's another one that has a special place in my heart because I played it, or at least a version of it anyways, in an almost two year campaign that you can watch uh, over on the Tales of Anaria channel. I'll link to it here. Yeah, this was the build for Ceridon. Uh, this is your quintessential Hexblade Warlock with a Pally Dip. And in this case, some Bard levels, though when I played it, I opted for Sorcerer levels instead. I mean, being able to get advantage on all of your attacks thanks to either Darkness and Devil Sight, or later Shadow of Moil, or Greater Invisibility, and then have a super high crit chance and be able to throw down both a Divine Smite and an Eldritch Smite on the same attack, it was just so dang devastating in-game. And even when you weren't one-shotting baddies with crazy burst damage, thanks to advantage and polearm master and great weapon master, your sustained damage was still ridiculously good. But to be fair, the build isn't perfect. Until you get to Shadow of Moil or Greater Invisibility, or in my case, you get a special homebrew spell, <laughs> that darkness bubble can make combat pretty aggravating for your allies, unless they all have blind sight, right? And the setup round is for sure obnoxious. It's actually the reason why when I played this character in game, I decided to forego the better burst damage from Whisper's Bard and instead take some sorcerer levels so I could quicken my invisibility or darkness or whatever and then move into combat right on round one right but yeah if you're gonna play one hex blade in your lifetime I would strongly recommend this one it's so powerful the starry twilight healer boo boo twilight the Starry Twilight Healer wasn't my first healer build, that was the Lore Bard uh, with a Life Cleric Dip. Ooh, I'm gonna run out of cards. Nor, I think, the healer who could heal the most damage, which was probably the ultimate healer build. But it was the first and one of the only times that I've used the arguably overpowered Twilight Cleric in a build. And yeah, even though we only took six levels of Cleric there, largely in an, in an attempt to temper how many temporary hit points we were going to be doling out on the regular, it still would probably be the most aggravating healer build for any DM to have to play against, I think. Thanks to the extra healing that they get from Star's Druid, combined with just a constant stream of temporary hit points for probably your entire party and fantastic healing spells. Otherwise, this character would just be a freaking battery of hit points for everybody. And it's hard to imagine any part party member ever dying while they were around. Unless the DM found a way to just focus fire them down every time, in which case I hope you've got a backup healer to bounce them back. But yeah, even if your DM did that, I feel like it would take so many enemy turns and resources to try and pull that off that by the time they did, the enemies would just about all be dead anyways. Really, really potent build here, and maybe a great way to bring a super optimized arguably overpowered character to a game where you mostly want your friends, who might not be as in tune with their optimization game, to shine. The Clockwork Controller. Come on. A year or two before this build, I had done something similar with the uh, Control Freak. And I'm sure that that's my last card if I even have one. I think that one was the first build I'd ever done that was dedicated solely to controlling enemies on the battlefield. There was one little problem with that build though. It was really, really boring to play. <laughs> in my opinion, at least. I actually tried it out in a one-shot, and yeah, it was incredibly powerful, but it was so dull. I did nothing but just lock enemies down round after round, and then like 
took a nap while I waited for my turn to come back around where I just continue to do the same thing. My goal then with the clockwork controller was to see if not only I could build a better controller than the control freak, but to build one that was a little more fun to play in game, who had more things they could do on their turn than just control. And thanks to the clockwork soul sorcerer's access to almost all of the best spells in game, coupled with their ability to cast spells once in a while with their bonus action, thanks to quicken spell, right, while still using their action to lock enemies down via some enchanter wizard levels, I think we accomplished what we set out to do with this one. The Stealth Bomber. I have built many assassins over the years, from the Assassinator to the Assassin's Creed to my most recent expose uh, on the new 2024 Assassin, right? Only one of them, I think, actually took advantage of the Assassin's automatic critical hits on a surprised enemy to cast spells at their target, however. And in the end, they outdamaged them all. Yeah, assuming the enemy was surprised, and yeah, even accounting for sneak attack and divine smite, which this build didn't take advantage of, right? And even in one case, uh, the Grave Cleric's Path to the Grave for a quadruple damage hit. I did that on the Assassin's Creed build. It turns out that Scorching Ray just hits like a ton of bricks when you can cast it at a really high level with all of the rays automatically critting and then you're piling on extra damage to every one of those rays thanks to things like the bugbear surprise attacks and hexploit's curse if you didn't need to have surprise on your enemy to get the full damage from this build i think it would be a shoe in for the winner here as is you'll just do awesome burst damage when you don't have surprise and yeah this build would still be pretty dang good even with the new 2024 rules with the changes to assassins and surprise but then yeah under 2014 you're doing game breaking rage inducing combat encounter ending damage when you do have surprise. Burst of Light. Similar to the Starry Night build, sometimes you need to do damage to multiple enemies, but sometimes you need that damage to come in the form of not sustained round after round damage, but instead massive, bursty, fireball -y explosions of death. And who would have thought that the best character for doing that would be a Light Cleric? Not me. I I'm sure you already knew that. I didn't. Until I built it. And yeah, putting Fireball on a Cleric who can also cast Spirit Guardians, among other things, means that, with the help of a Fighter's Action Surge, you can do some insane damage in a single round to multiple enemies, and then still be mostly a Cleric to keep your body buffed and healed while you bring the pain. Such a great package of burst damage and support on this character that I think it is one of the strongest that I've done, for sure. The Oathbreaker the thing about the Oathbreaker build that I love the most is that they're probably my most well-rounded character I've ever done, I think. I mean, thanks in part to one itty-bitty level dip into Hexblade. I know, felt a little dirty. But hey, on an Oathbreaker, I think it makes more sense than it does for just about any other build. But yeah, as a result, they do really solid damage with just a spear and a shield, thus letting me live out my favorite Spartan fantasy. They have fantastic survivability, armor class, they can bring great healing and buffing, they never fail a saving throw, and even make an incredible party face. The only thing this build can't really do very well is act as the party's, like, stealthy scout, I guess? Pretty much everything else they can not only do, but do well. They're, like, not a jack-of-all-trades master of none, they're more like a master of all trades. I love, love, love the all-rounder capabilities of this build. They would win the decathlon, for sure. Maybe with the help of some skeleton and zombie friends. And the Colby Award goes to... Not Twilight, not Twilight. The Clockwork Controller. The Clockwork Controller, congratulations, you get the Colby for the most powerful build. Not a big surprise for longtime viewers of my channel, I think. I mean, up until I did this build, I commonly claimed that the Control Freak was the most powerful build I'd ever done. And I think this build edges that one out by just a hair, since they really have access to all the best control spells still and can still hypnotize, but just have a little more versatility thanks largely to metamagic. I will offer a word of warning on this build though, and the control freak too. If you bring this build to your DM's table, be prepared for them to become incredibly frustrated with you. Talk to them beforehand so they know what you're planning on doing. I hope that won't mean that they just find a ton of ways to try and counter you, and every enemy has 
a really high saving throw in the specific ability that they need it, right? But they might make some adjustments to some of their encounters to still make it challenging for your party if you've got a character like this just locking down most of the battlefield every single round. And that brings us to the final category of the show. The one that is the most subjective out of all of them, but my favorite category, and that is the most fun build. The funnest? Now, pretty much all of the nominees here could potentially overlap into either best concept build or most powerful, sometimes both. So if you thought I left your favorite build out of one of those other categories, you might find it here. And I guess that's the best way I would describe the builds that show up here. For me, they rate really high on the power meter because I think it's fun to play really powerful characters, but then they often bring a uniqueness to their playstyle that might be a little out of the ordinary, or maybe they just shine for sheer versatility or flavor. And here to present the nominees are the guys who I am such a star fanboy of I flew all the way to their hometown in Toronto to spy on them at their office and their favorite restaurants. <laughs> they inspired me to start my channel and are the kindest, wisest, friendliest, and most talented dudes who have ever crawled through a dungeon. That's right, Kelly Amonti, the Dungeon Dudes. We're gonna give him this unedited footage. Yeah, and he's gonna figure it out. Yeah, and he's, he, right, presumably. So we shouldn't... We shouldn't say the mean things that we say about Colby when the cameras are off, in front of the camera. No, you shouldn't say the mean things that you say about Colby. Yeah, like that I'm really mad at him because I thought that you and I had the monopoly on the attractive D&D content creators, and then he had to swoop in and steal the spotlight, and now we have to be the second and third most attractive male content creators in the industry. Thanks, Colby, for that. I can only work out so much, and I'm also extremely lazy and love cheeseburgers. What am I supposed to do, Colby? God. Um. Where's the Colby Award for second most attractive man on the internet, hmm? Where's my Colby Award? Honestly, I'm just upset he hasn't moved to Canada so we can't play, can play D&D. Where's the time. Colby Award for three guys playing D&D in a studio together, hmm? Where's that? Yeah, well. Come on. God. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. Are we doing the yeah, whole intro? Yeah, of course we're doing If Colby wants to cut it out, he can do it. You that. can cut the intro, I don't. Uh, but I think we want. have to, because yeah, we can't yeah. film without us. Okay. Yeah. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the, the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. And we are pleased to present the Colby Award in the category of the most fun build uh, that Colby has created over the past several years. There were many contenders, but we will have the nominees, please. We're also here to debate whether the term funnest is a word. Is it the most fun or is it the funnest build? I think uh, it's the most fun build is technically correct, which is the best. Uh, this is a fantasy game, and I think we're allowed to use fantasy words. So here's the nominations for the funnest. But even if funnest is a word... It's a fantasy a word. Yeah, but the most fun build feels more befitting of an award than funnest. If this is your first Colby Award, uh, this the Colby Awards are my favorite award show on the internet. And um, I'm hoping that one day I could win a Colby Award. Um, but today's not that day. With that, the nominees are... The Blade Singer Tank! As you all undoubtedly know, I've done a lot of Bladesinger builds on my channel, but the Bladesinger tank is probably the one that I most want to play in game that I haven't had a chance to play yet. I think of all my builds, perhaps with the exception of the monk tank, it kind of is a really different take on a tank. Not a big hulking character in heavy armor with a shield, but a nimble lithe tank who floats like a butterfly and stings like a mosquito. Punch out fans. Anyone. It was also the most unique use of the armor that I've ever done, still having kind of a full suit of armor, but keeping it light armor. And we're still making attacks primarily with our gauntleted fists. It just brought a level of durability and versatility and flavor that I think outshines all my other tank builds to date. And for that, I love it. The Cosmic Controller. 
it's fitting that Monty and Kelly read off this name because it is one of the many builds that they inspired me to do with their multi-classing tier ranking video series, right? This is one where I was challenged to make a good monk cleric multi-class, and boy did we. I love the flavor of this character, a monk who really leans into like the spirituality aspect of monks even more than the hone my body to perfection aspect. As a result, we got to be more wisdom focused than dexterity, but it still worked great for damage since we went astral self coupled with a twilight cleric for a cool starry astrally motif that lets us grapple multiple enemies, pummel them with our astral arms, drag them in and out of moonbeam, or hold them still inside our spirit guardians for lots of damage, lots of control, and lots of flavor. The Psy Knife. To be fair, this one doesn't actually rank all that high on the power meter, I don't think, or at least not all that high on the damage meter, right? But it was my attempt to combine the two psionic martial classes, the Psy Knife Rogue and the Psy Warrior Fighter for the ultimate psionic, and you guys really seem to love it as it's still one of my most watched D&D builds of all time, and for good reason, I think. Having both of these subclasses with all of their various psionic power and psionic dice just really made you like the most versatile non-caster in the game, perhaps. They have so much utility, make such a great skill monkey, and bring some support, some easy teleportation, decent damage, and tons of just cool factor that I couldn't, in good conscience, keep them off the list here, even if they weren't necessarily topping the damage charts. The Fey Wanderer. This is still the ranger I most want to play if and when I ever play a ranger in game. Forget the Gloomstalker. I want to be a lion surrounded by a swarm of pixies that smells like lavender. <laughs> I loved making this ranger melee focused, which isn't something we see a lot of in 5e, but also sad, single ability score dependent, as a result of them using shillelagh and a quarterstaff for attacks. The most powerful aspect of this character, though, I think, came in the form of the control that they would bring to the battlefield thanks to all the fear effects that they got from their species, their spells, and their subclass features. Adding some spore druid levels did some great things for their damage, and their survivability, and their support capabilities late game, and the fact that they could summon not one, but two fae spirits eventually to fight for them just brought a lot of potency and fun roleplay opportunity that was super unique and magical. The Bardic Brawler. You've probably heard me say on multiple occasions that this is my most underrated build, and I still believe it. I mean, look, you're a bard, right? Already, you're having a great time. Also, you're an elephant. Okay, even better. But also, you're an insanely great grappler. What? Okay, weird. Why? So that you can control multiple enemies and deal a boatload of damage to each of them every single round via Cloud of Daggers. This build destroys anything that I've ever done for sustained multi-target damage and keeps potentially multiple enemies from really doing anything effective in combat other than attacking you. Thankfully, the build's pretty dang tanky. It's so good and so unique and so fun. To be fair, it does have its drawbacks, the biggest of which being that it takes a second to get everything going in combat if you're going to cast a spell and then start Start grappling enemies, right? And yeah, you might want to protect your concentration even more than I did by taking Warcaster, for example, but still, the Bardic Brawler, I'm telling you, if you haven't seen this video, you should go watch it. And if you haven't played this build, you should try it out, in a one-shot at least, to realize just how awesome it can be. The Bladesinger, both 2.0 or 3.0. This just in, Colby likes Bladesingers. <laughs> Yeah, of course I've got to include the build that kind of put me on the map for so many of my viewers. I included both Bladesinger 2.0 and 3.0, aka the Flame Singer, because in reality the builds were very similar. 3.0 took some fighter levels, mostly to give us some Nova damage capabilities, but I don't think you'd be wrong to stick to just straight wizard here like I did on like the 2.0 version, right? You guys know how I feel about this subclass. People like to argue that the best Bladesingers don't try to go into melee much, but instead act like typical wizards, throwing out control spells primarily, making weapon attacks when there's nothing else better to do, and then just benefiting from some nice defensive perks. And if you want to play your Bladesinger that way, then you totally should. From my perspective, if you enjoy playing a melee character, and you want to play a melee weapon damage dealer, Bladesinger just brings a level of versatility and power and fun that's really hard to get from any other melee weapon user in D&D 5e, and I continue to feel that way. The Catch-22. Oh, this one's a good time. 
I played this build in a one-shot with the Dungeon Dudes and Chris, uh, celebrating my 30,000 uh, subscriber milestone. I don't have cards left to link to it, but that's what the thumbnail looks like. I actually played him in another one-shot with my friends before that as well. To be fair, uh, in the one-shot with the Dudes and with Chris, the build didn't work quite as well as I saw it work before, due largely to the types of enemies that Monty pitted us against, but it still held its own. And actually, I didn't even come up with the concept for this build myself. One of my viewers, Rob Vera, did. But Man, it was just so fun to imagine and play and build around. A Conquest, Pally, Divine Soul Sorcerer, Rune Knight Fighter, Whispers Bard, who would cast Cloud of Daggers, knock their enemy into Cloud via a Maul and the Crusher feet with a booming Blade attack, thus forcing the enemy on their turn to make a choice. Do I stay in the Cloud and continue to take damage, or do I move out of the Cloud and take damage for moving, right, from Booming Blade. Either way, they were screwed, and putting enemies into that scenario over and over in combat just never got old for me. Combined with Smite and Psychic Blades and Action Surge and plenty of defense and support capability as well, this build just brought a ton of Nova Burst, versatility, and power, and they were so fun to play. The Ashardalon's Strider. <sighs> this build, more than any other I've done, I think, conjures up images that just make me giggle with glee. I was going to put this one in the best concept category, but had to move it here based on the sheer joy that it brings me just to think about. The idea was to build around the Ashardalon Stride spell, you know, the one that does damage to enemies when you just run past them, right? What we ended up with was a speedster who had Scribe's Wizard levels, Scout Rogue levels, and Tempest Cleric levels that by the end, transformed the fire damage from a Shardalon Stride into lightning damage, and then would actually knock back every single enemy that they simply ran past in combat, akin to like Quicksilver from the X-Men movies, just blazing past everyone and leaving a mess of flying bad guys in their wake. And it's just, it's everything. To be fair, I think the build would be the most fun at high level once you got your Tempest Cleric stuff into place. But even before that happens, it was just such a unique playstyle where you made an attack on your turn sure, but did most of your damage to multiple enemies just by running around. And that was awesome. The wizard tank? I know, I know, I already have a wizard tank nominated here, but this was my first, and I think probably better of the two, at least from a survivability standpoint. I'd never heard up to this point of anyone trying to make a wizard whose primary role was to actually encourage enemies to attack them instead of their allies, and who had the fortitude to actually stay on their feet if they accomplished that goal, until I built this character, and it was just a lot of fun to realize that with just a few levels in Armor Artificer, and a single level dip into Warlock, we could transform your typically brainy, pointy hat wearing wizard into an unkillable beast on the battlefield. Abjuration is just such a great subclass for survivability. That arcane ward just does work. And combined with a few other things, yeah, this build brought so much survivability as well as everything else that wizards can bring in the form of utility, control, and even AoE damage that it just felt like kind of a revelation to me at the time. This is another one that I have seen in action in a one shot and yeah, it worked as advertised. Maybe better, even. And the Cyclops. I love this build because it felt like a fusion of two of my favorite X-Men, uh, Wolverine and Psylocke. You got all the cool factor of the Cyknife Rogue mixed with the savagery and damage benefits of the Beast Barbarian fused here into one strength-based rogue character who made a ton of attacks both with their psychic blades and their claws for pretty solid sustained damage per round, as well as all of the utility and versatility and just cool factor of the Cyknife Rogue, right? Next time I play a rogue in game, I think I'm playing this one. And we have right here our uh, professional secret envelope that holds the Colby Award winner. Which we haven't seen until opening this envelope. This, this uh, was shipped complete... to us by the uh, executive team at the Colby's. Yes, and we haven't seen it. We have no idea what actually this envelope contains. We are, we are finding this out live right now. And the award goes to... The Blade Singer. Congratulations to the Blade Singer. Best subclass for the best class. You know, out of all the combos that Colby does, the award just went to the straight up Blade Singer. Yeah, um, I, I, I could have told you that. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it rocks. Yeah. Congratulations to the Blade Singer. And to everybody else who won a Colby Award this year. Thank you. 
In other news, the sky is blue and water makes us wet. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I wasn't fooling anybody with which one I would pick here, but again, three for three, my channel members seem to agree with me. Maybe I've just brainwashed all of you into agreeing with me. But yes, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, I have never had more fun playing any other character in D&D than I have with a Bladesinger. In fact, I loved them so much that I played one in two full campaigns, a homebrew one and a Storm King's Thunder. I mean, you are a freaking kick-ass, shadow blade wielding Jedi wizard. You have strong defense, strong offense, and then you can teleport all over the battlefield. You can heal with life transference in a pinch, and like throw down wall of force or fireball if you need to. How could you not love playing this character? I obviously can't fathom it, and so yes, they win the Colby for the most fun build ever. So that's the end of the awards. What did I miss? Let me know in the comments, and I also would love to hear, in fact, my very favorite comments that I get from you guys is when you tell me about one of my builds that you have played in-game, whether to great success or great failure. It always really warms my heart to hear those stories, so please share. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope you have enjoyed the journey with me over the last four years as I have tried to lovingly craft all 170 so of these builds for you and for me to play with, whether in-game or just in our heads. Man, I love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting me, whether you've been here since that very first Hexblade build or if this is the first of my videos that you've ever seen. I am so grateful for you. I hope that you have a fantastic day and a really great week. And if you don't, I really hope that you'll hang in there. Please don't give up. I hope that you will do good and be kind and that I see you again very soon as we start to make predictions for and then divulge details on the next chapter of the channel, the updated 2024 rules. But until then, Take care. Bye. Hey, is it my fault that the fallen embers burn down in a spiral round your crown of thieves? My body tells me no, but I won't quit. Cause I want more Cause I want more And it rides out of town <laughs> So good Young the Giant, come on There is not a better song In my opinion When it comes to like If you need some energy Right? To kind of I don't know, get through a workout or whatever it is that you might be doing. Mmm, so good. I've been messing with the mic for like a half hour before hitting record. So, whew, here's hoping for my sake and for Dallin's. We've actually got it dialed in today. Hmm, we'll see. Fisheye cameras giving me headaches. Oh, yet again, I failed to create an intro. Like, just like that? No, okay. I'm asking too much, aren't I? I'm asking too much. Stop. Stop, Colby. Stop. Don't touch it. <laughs> okay, what am I gonna say? Um, mm, whew, kinda hot in this jacket. July is not a month for velvet. <laughs> Professional secret envelope? I like that you wrote that. I want people to know that this this is not messing around. Okay. You don't... You're, is you this... No, no. Sir, is this how you fold a piece of paper? Okay, there's a joke here, and I went with it, and it's how shitty <laughs> our envelope and piece of paper are. That's part of my joke. You, I don't need to explain my humor to you, Monty. It's, it's part of it. <laughs> I don't know if there are any other Colby Awards being presented. Well, I don't know.